Good afternoon and welcome, or for many of you, welcome back to the joint HMA-EMA workshop on artificial, artificial intelligence and medicines regulation. Um, welcome uh, from the EMA building in Amsterdam. My name is uh, Peter Arlett. I'm head of data analytics and methods task force at the agency, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you back and to kick off day two. I think we all recognize that the potential of artificial intelligence to improve health is huge through the development of medicines, the oversight and supervision of medicines, and by the delivery of healthcare. And we explored many of those uh, points yesterday. Indeed, we heard about the state of the art from uh, world-class speakers. We heard uh, different use cases through the life cycle of medicines. We heard that data is the new soil. We heard that rules are out and data is in. And we also heard about not just a learning healthcare system, but a deep learning healthcare system. We were very pleased to have 430 participants taking part yesterday, and we expect to have at least that number again today. So let's turn to our agenda today. We have two sessions, uh, one of which uh, is hearing about existing recommendations from different uh, strategic initiatives on artificial intelligence. And then the main session, the, the longer session of this afternoon, is to hear from stakeholders and have an open debate about what are the priorities for action to ensure that medicines regulation is ready to grasp the opportunities from artificial intelligence, and whether there are any gaps, and um, what the views of stakeholders are. I'm hugely grateful to all those uh, that contributed yesterday and everybody that's speaking, chairing, listening, asking questions, either in the Q&A box or um, uh, verbally today. And I wish you a very productive afternoon. Um, on that note, I hand over to Jesper Kerr, who heads the Data Analytics Center at the Danish Medicines Agency, who's going to chair us through the first of the two sessions this afternoon. Jesper, over to you. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for allowing us to go through some of the uh, kind of strategic initiatives and the strategies laid out uh, here today. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes for, for this session, because it is a packed session. Um, we'll have no discussions in it, but we'll refer that to the table, round table discussion afterwards. But do feel free to use the Q&A to place any questions during the talks, and we'll definitely follow up on those uh, as we then move into the roundtable discussion. So uh, with that, I will probably like to just uh, get ourselves started with the uh, kind of overview of the European Medicines Agency's network to strategy to 2025, uh, and with a focus on uh, digital transformation. And if I can ask the organizers to put the slide deck on, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So this will be a uh, walkthrough of some of the elements in the network strategy. We'll not be spending the en entire session today talking through all of these. Um, but the presentation here will, will basically highlight to you the development and finalization of the strategy as I've ended last year and then taking it into this year. Highlight a summary of some of the results from the public consultation. Uh, a peek into the final strategy document itself and then just ending on the implementation plans before we then move on to some of the other speakers, then going into further details on some of these digital transformation initiatives. The uh, development of itself uh, really was centered around uh, six strategic focus areas for the next five years, which are highlighted here. Uh, it, it was a joint drafting group defining the goals and the objectives and the challenges, then also making sure that this will actually be aligned with the European Commission's farmer strategy, uh, the uh, regulatory science strategy and uh, the interdependencies with other initiatives, just making sure that everything is well aligned. Um, consultation with EMA committees, working parties and HMA working groups, also take the input from there and then discussion of the recommendations uh, for actions for implementation through the multi-annual work plans uh, that will be following this. Um, it's actually rather recent, uh, by the end of last year, that the final document was agreed by the EMA HMA drafting group in mid-October, and EMA management board and the HMA uh, then through written procedures launched this by end of October uh, to reach a final version for a joint strategy document uh, with some report on public consultation uh, by the 13th of November, and then a final strategy document uh, was really considered for adoption following that review by both the EMA and the HMA drafting group. 
Just a few high-level summary of the results of the public consultation for you to be aware about. Um, there were early stakeholder consultation in March and a two-month public consultation over summer. Uh, it had input from more than 177 different stakeholder groups uh, with a broad range of feedback on all themes. Um, but overall, uh, with the impression of stakeholders uh, was good around the strategy. Um, and then, obviously, which is super important, why we also have this workshop today, emphasis need uh, from all stakeholders to collaborate to make it a success. That's also why you see this broad uh, stakeholder engagement at this workshop. Uh, Final Dr. BMA, Management Board of Seven, HMA in November, and published in December uh, with the summary of the public consultation analysis available on the website. Just a peek into the final strategy document to set the stage for today and then kind of a starting point for some of our discussions. Uh, we just looked at these overall strategic focus areas around availability and accessibility of medicines. Data analytics, digital tools, and digital, tra digital transformation, which is part of the deep dive we're going to do in this session and continue into further uh, talks. Uh, the innovation piece, just to highlight elements there relevant uh, to AI. Antimicrobial <laughs> resistance and non emerging health threats, not a focus area for this discussion today, nor supply chain challenges or sustainability of the network and operational excellence as such. If you go and see the report, here's the link on the website. And as I said, two areas that we're going to focus on right now uh, for, for this part. Um, in the theme of data analytics, digital tools, and digital transformations, there are four goals mentioned. Uh, one of them is around the enablement of access to an analysis of routine healthcare data, um, analysis of this patient data from clinical trials and standardization on targeted data. And you'll see other workshops coming in the future around data standards, and you will hear more about the uh, analytic capabilities. Um, goal two being build sustainability, uh, sustainable capability and capacity in the network, including statistics, epidemiology, real world data, and advanced analytics. And part of this also lends itself to AI. Uh, goal three promote dynamic regulation and policy learning within the current regulatory framework, uh, living in a very uh, uh, agile and fast-moving technology landscape, uh, I think that is uh, well suited uh, as a goal for being a match to the capabilities within analytics and digital tools. Then goal four, to ensure that data security and ethical considerations are embedded into the governance of data within the network. If we look at goal one uh, with the deeper dive, there are a number of objectives associated with that. Just highlight those here, and then we'll hear a little more later. It's the Darwin EU uh, delivering a sustainable platform to access and analyze healthcare data from across the, the EU. It's a pilot analysis of uh, patient level data from clinical trials uh, uh, for initial market authorization assessments um, with a view to a target rollout of such analysis uh, into the network. Uh, established collaborations with the external stakeholders patients, academia, uh, non-governmental organizations and industry, uh, and then with international regulatory authorities on big data initiatives, uh, learning from us around us and, and taking input. Establish an EU framework for data quality, discoverability, representativeness. Those of you who have attended the Metadata Workshop the past week will have heard some of that initial work. Um, and all of that through the agreement of metadata for regulatory purposes, standardization roadmap, and registers of real world data sources of observational studies. On goal two, um, there are two objectives for building EU network capability to analyze big data, really lifting, make all boats float. Um, digital transformation of the EU network scientific and regulatory processes. So we can actually use these digital tools in, in analytics as well. And then also supporting our digital infrastructure uh, to uptake and use uh, big data from electronic records, registries, devices, et cetera. And a massive objective in front of this, um, but one I'm pretty confident we'll see. On goal three, uh, an objective about modernizing delivery scientific advice at central and national level by, again, developing the network skills and processes 
of using data inside of these uh, scientific advices, so really becoming data driven. And then a goal four, uh, an objective around ensuring data that are managed and analyzed within secure and ethical governance frameworks. So also building that out. A lot of these elements have actually AI inside of them. If you go through reading the details in the report, you'll see wherever that can actually support reaching, uh, fulfilling these goals through the objectives. I just wanted within the frame we have here, also on the innovation goal, just to highlight that a number of innovative tasks and goals laid out in the report actually has elements of artificial intelligence embedded into it. And I think if you go across some of these catalyzed integration of science and technology medicines development, uh, this kind of comes more natural from what happens around us of embedding AI into many different solutions. Uh, also fostering collaborative evidence generation by improving scientific quality of evaluations, where we can see that AI can play a role. I think we saw a few examples and mentions of that yesterday, although more in healthcare settings, it definitely feeds into the regulatory landscape too. And then on goal three, enable and leverage research and innovation through regulatory science. It almost goes without saying that that has to include a major portion around AI. And then enhance collaboration with other stakeholders, including medical device experts, where we do see AI embedded, notified bodies, uh, SMEs and research and academic groups, just like we did yesterday and that we're going to continue to do. If we take a few looks into some of these goals, just to highlight a few of them where it's, it's even articulated in the report that AI plays a role, is when we'll look at non-clinical models and principles and options optimizing modeling, simulation, extrapolation, as you see in goal two, objective two. I'll not go through all of the details here. It will definitely be AI in many of them, but here we've actually articulated the huge potential in applying AI. It also goes for goal four, objective one, uh, increased collaboration between medical device authorities and notified bodies in exchange of knowledge and facilitation of collaboration. Um, and it also goes to promote uh, early interaction with academia, research, and SMEs with a view to increase awareness of regulatory requirements and facilitation of translation of research into authorized additional products and then clinical practice. We do see a number of these being developed in academia with a huge portion of AI in it. So, just to, to mention a few areas where we'll, we'll start the discussions from today with some of the other presenters as well. The plan for implementation of the strategy is uh, that we will, within a multi-annual program between this year and 24, uh, focus on three main pillars on product-related activities, strategies, and public health activities program and projects. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to be a prime focus of the EMA and the network itself. Uh, so just being very much aware about that, how that uh, defines uh, our workload and what to focus on. Uh, but EMA and HMA are committed to continue to collaborate to identify and translate these actions into relevant work programs and implementation plans. And you will see a number of workshops and other initiatives where we're reaching out now in these uh, days and weeks and months. Uh, progress reports will be presented regularly to both EMA Management Board and, and HMA to keep us on our toes. And overall review of the strategy will con be conducted every 13 to 18 months to ensure that uh, goals and objectives are still applicable. Uh, just like part of the session today is really an evaluation if what we are putting forward uh, are fully crisply aligned with uh, what uh, the current situation demands. Um, so thank you for listening to this piece of it. Um, and I think this, this to me then opens the stage for our next presenter um, that I would like to call in to focus on the Big Data Task Force recommendations and regulatory science strategy and AI. So Gian Mario Candore, uh, who is a statistician at the uh, Data Analytics and Method Task Force at the EMA, will give us uh, a walkthrough of uh, these recommendations and the regulatory science strategy. Over to you, Gian Mario. Thank you, Jesper, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be part of this workshop. So in this presentation, as highlighted by Jesper, we are going to highlight the recommendations that come from two sources, the Big Data Task Force and the Regulatory Science Strategies. And the aim of this presentation will be to inform the discussion that will happen afterwards so that we can identify gaps, uh, potential gaps, and have uh, feedback on this recommendation. Before starting, I would like to uh, thank Luis for having mapped the recommendation from two data sources. 
So how are we going to present the recommendation? First, we will briefly intro in setting the scene, introducing the two sources that were, uh, where this recommendation were developed. Then we are going to see what was the, um, the reasoning underlying the principle that we follow when developing this recommendation. And finally, we will highlight the 15 recommendation um, grouped in six categories. So starting with setting the scene and the first source of recommendation, the HMA EMA Joint Task Force on Big Data was formed in 2017 with the main aim to explore the challenges and opportunities posed by big data in medicine regulation. Initially in the task force, six work stream were created, one for each data source, and then an additional work stream on analytical techniques was added. And in this additional work stream, AI had quite a relevant role. The task force produced two reports. Phase one report identified opportunities for leveraging this big data and um, come out with 47 recommendations and almost 140 action. And first two report as a, as a aim to prioritize, going through this recommendation, select the one with a higher priority and decide how and when they would be uh, addressed. The final, uh, final output of phase two is then the, the well-known 10 priority recommendations that are shown on the right side of the slides. What is important to highlight is that in both phase one and in phase two report, AI had a separate chapter with separate recommendation. And what we're gonna see now greatly inherit the benefit from that work. Then the second source for what we're gonna see is the regulatory science strategy to 2025. That was published 31st of March last year. In here, there were five key goals and in two of them, AI was explicit. And these are the two highlighted in blue in the slide. So this was the goal of driving collaborative evidence generation and enabling and leveraging research and innovation regulatory science. So now we saw the source, let's see how we developed the recommendation. And we started with three main uh, points. We wanted to know what is the overall aim of AI within the regulatory network? Where we see, and we will see AI in action in our work. And finally, the third point was, what do we want in terms of requirement from an AI system to be, to be used for regulatory purpose? And so let's see what were the answer to these three question. The first question, aim of AI within the regulatory network, we saw that we have mainly two aims, and this was repeated and shown already yesterday in almost every presentation. We believe that uh, the aim of the AI within the network could be to both improve efficiency through process automation and inform decision-making supporting the evidence generation. Then where do we see AI impacting our work already and where do we uh, will impact even more in the future? And we have identified four uh, activities where we see AI. Two with an, uh, driven externally, so coming from the external and two coming from internal. So starting with the first activity that we call legislation and external collaboration, here we, we see how um, the European Commission as and this working on a legislative requirement regulation white paper on artificial intelligence. And we can also see how there are many stakeholders, other EU agencies that are working on AI. So it's definitely an area where we should support and provide input in this development. Then um, a team we uh, the second area is what we call regulatory submission. And here is where we receive from external uh, input that we need to regulate and to, and to provide. So we will provide regulatory and scientific support to develop our own medicine and device that utilize an AI component. Uh, example could be when AI is used uh, to, individualize, uh, to define individualized treatment or when AI is using clinical trial to match uh, um, patient or when uh, there are devices with digital endpoint. Moving to the activities with an internal driver, these are the digitalization and process automation. And here is where AI can be exploited exploit as part of the digital business transformation, aiming at process efficiency. And then the four activity is healthcare data analytics. And here is where AI could be used to interrogate data to gain insight.
So we answered two of the first que of the questions that we ask. And the third one is, what do we want an AI system to look like? What are the, um, the requirements that we would like? And we, even in this case, we identify four requirements. From an AI system, from the evidence produced from the AI, we would like that this is being meaningful. That means that the data on which the AI is based need to contain all the relevant information of adequate quality and representativeness. Then once we have data that are meaningful and of adequate quality, we want to extract and produce valid evidence from this thanks to the AI algorithm. And here we have to do that applying the right methodology. And we saw yesterday from a presentation from Peter Weinberg, how for instance, external validation is an important component of the methodology to use. Third, we would like that the evidence is produced in an expedited way, meaning that it's synchronized with the decision-making process or the business process where this is needed. And fourth, we would like that the evidence produced by AI is ultimately trusted by the decision maker. The four that is uh, transparent, auditable, reproducible, and there is human oversight when needed. So these were the principles behind the development of the recommendation. And now uh, just the last two final remark before going through uh, each of the recommendations. As said, we took this recommendation from two sources and there was some overlap. So we tried to minimize the overlap, rephrasing some of them. So they do not correspond exactly with what was published. Moreover, we, and we already saw that, there are some non-AI specific recommendation that however have a significant impact on AI. And we already mentioned all the aspects related to data. These recommendations on data are not part of what we are going to see, but we do consider them as a fundamental building block for AI and are treated more extensively in other recommendations like the HMA MA top 10, top 10 recommendation. So these are the, um, how we are going to present the recommendation. We split them in six categories to make the presentation easier. And we recognize that the classification is not a clear cut and it can be improved, but hopefully it will help both the presentation, but also to align the main characteristic. At the top, we see um, two aspects of how we can um, gain learn. So both through hands-on experimentation and through more classical learning. So these are the two, first two categories. Then on the right side, we see that we need to provide uh, guidance for methodology and we need to provide also the right governance. And on the left side, we, we, we can see how we can, we are not gonna do this alone, but we will do that collaborating with other stakeholders and uh, launching initiative with them. So starting with the first uh, um, recommendation of promoting experience. Here, we see two specific recommendations. The first one is what we call experimentation with AI or sandbox. What this means, we want to establish a digital innovation lab to explore, pilot, and develop a solution. So this is a way to learn and being able to leverage digital technology and AI across the drug regulation spectrum. We would like to provide a space where data, where the people can experiment with data, can experiment with algorithm, can run simulation. And when the experiment is successful, hopefully these are translated into production, are uh, yeah, translated into production. We can apply this model of experimentation also to external stakeholders. And here is where the second recommendation come into place, when we make regulatory data open uh, for a researcher. So in this, uh, in this way, we can expose no sensitive data and will allow researchers to develop novel and possible disruptive approaches, analytical approaches. If we're gonna do this, of course, data security and privacy will be of extremely importance and they must be implemented by design. Then close to the hands on learning is the more, the more let's say formal learning and the skill development. And in this group, we foresee four specific recommendations. The first one is what we call develop capability. And here is where we aim to establish capability to perform three things. First is to validate the algorithm. Then is to be able to critical appraisal studies that contain AI or advanced analytics. And third, we would like to perform these studies also in-house. 
An example of this are, for instance, studies that we receive that are uh, clinical prediction modeling into that. And we would like to critically assess whether this has been done according to the right methodology. To be able to reach this free aim of validation, critical appraisal and uh, doing the study in-house, we need to upskill the EMA and the EU regulatory network. And we foresee, we alight four ways in which this upskilling can happen. Through curriculum development, through knowledge sharing, collaboration with external expert, and also target recruitment. And in this area, we would like to highlight what is happening um, in the curriculum development. Last, um, last year, a curriculum on data literacy has been started, and uh, we aim to finalize it this year from the Big Data Task Force. Moreover, as a Big Data signpost has been published where um, the main training on Big Data are referenced. And fourth, there was a survey on training and there will be a dedicated presentation just afterwards. Still in the category of learning and skill gap, uh, we, do, we do recognize that we will never have a, uh, unlikely we will have all the expertise in house. So we do need to engage with expert and we need to be able to identify and enable the access to the best experts, both in Europe and internationally. And hopefully this expert will then be channeled through an EMA expert group on AI that will be uh, they will uh, be asked to support us for particular requests, but, uh, but he can also, through sharing of his knowledge, help us to improve uh, and uh, um, to improve our, our skill. The topic of collaborating with expert um, lead uh, quite nicely to the third group of recommendation that we call partnership and collaboration. And here we see two specific uh, action. One is what we call international collaboration, where the aim is to achieve greater global alignment with other regulators, for instance, FDA. And we saw a presentation from FDA yesterday where we saw that both opportunity and challenges challenges that they are facing are similar to what we are doing. Therefore, there is opportunity for convergence, opportunity to leverage both expertise from uh, the different regulator uh, to minimize the duplication and also to minimize the burden on stakeholder if we come out with similar recommendation and similar guideline. Then we can also build partnership with academic and research center both to undertake research in what we think are the strategic area for regulatory science, but also to address rapidly emerging regulatory science research question. And we can influence this collaboration through a more ad hoc initiative. So this is the fourth group that we are going through. And even in this group, we foresee two more specific recommendations. The first one is to set up a research agenda. So to identify what are the priority for us and um, where we can provide funders so that these are addressed. So like for illustrative, uh, some illustrative example, we can think, for instance, at the uh, NLP. So we would like to know the performance and limitation when we use NLP to extract healthy, health data from real world data sources. Another area that we might want to prioritize could be to understand more about heterogeneity of treatment effect. So to identify the subset of population that benefit more or less from a specific treatment. Or a third area that we might want to prioritize is uh, developing new or improving signal detection methods from uh, spontaneous reporting. And we saw a presentation yesterday from uh, UNC about new signal detection methods, so something similar to that. Another initiative we, uh, we could do is to create and maintain a multi-stakeholder forum. So this would be a forum to engage with a diverse set of stakeholders in digital technology and AI. And it will be a forum where the stakeholders have the opportunity to provide their feedback on what are their priorities, what are the risks, the challenges, what is their perspective on AI. And it's more a forum where we can exchange and foster ideas about AI and this development. Moving to the fifth area, what we call methods and guidelines. And here we have three more specific recommendations. The first one is that we want to build a framework that supports the development of guidelines. 
So this framework will start including a gap analysis. So we want to highlight which guideline we would like to have and see what we already have. Once we have done this gap analysis exercise, we can then address which are the priority for the guideline to be developed, how this guideline should be developed, and which area they might impact, and also start thinking about success factor for this uh, new guideline. While we're developing this framework, we can uh, already start working on two other specific uh, framework. One is about assessing and validating AI, because this will be needed and done, so we know, already know there will be a priority. And second, we, 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 we can start working on establishing a framework for early engagement with the end user of AI. An example in this slide is to engage with health, healthcare professional, because AI can be used to monitor the patient and to provide the, the medicine that will be used by the patient. And finally, the sixth area. Um, we need some governance to address two of the most important uh, yeah, characteristics or concern that we have seen in AI, ethics and trust. Regarding ethics, this needs to be embedded in the governance. And what do we mean by ethics? Well, we mean that the AI must be used not only according to le legislative requirement, but also in line with our regulatory purpose and in line with the value of the society, so that both individuals and group are not discriminated or treated unfair. And then the second aspect is about trust. And we mentioned that already at the beginning when we we're looking at the principle that guide this recommendation. So we would like an AI that is transport, transparent, auditable, explainable when needed so that we can trust the evidence generated by it. And here in the final slide, we can see the six group um, that we went through with a specific recommendation that you already you also received through uh, a service center and last week. We, again, we do recognize that this classification is not clear cut. There are some recommendations that can, that maybe have overlap with different area, but we thought that it was uh, a good way to present them and to highlight the main characteristic of the 15 recommendation that we have proposed for discussion. And with this is all for me and I, Jasper, I, I go back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jan Mario, and also to keep uh, well within time for this. So uh, we may be running a little faster than we anticipated, but I may actually give people a break at the end, but let's see about that. Uh, we still have a few other talks, so. Maybe there's a room for some further elaboration if needed. The uh, next presentation is by uh, Agnes saint Clement from uh, EMA, who is heading up the uh, International Affairs Division, who's going to talk to us a bit, uh, today about the uh, IPMA AI recommendations. So uh, over to you, Agnes. Uh, thank you, Jasper, and a, um, I'm happy to present something that many, many of you probably won't know. I see Marie, first I have to introduce it, is the International Coalition of Medicines. Ah, I could turn on my video as well. Um, International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. It is a, a voluntary group of heads of agencies across the world. It has currently about 34 members and it's increasing in size. And WHO is, a, is an observer. And the um, this organization is uh, interested in a number of topics generally based on the common challenges for heads of agencies. And it has identified some years ago that innovation was a very uh, good topic for them to try to think about mostly the challenges in terms of regulatory framework, but also the need for expertise thinking that expertise might not be where we usually get it from academia in healthcare and a, but going in the case, for example, of artificial intelligence, clearly in the domain of mathematics and which is not our usual uh, expert. So it raises two issues that are the experts fit for purpose for the regulators, but also are they trained and do they understand our needs in addition to us having to understand their topics. So it's it's a quite an interesting challenge. Among the uh, innovation, we have a design maybe 
Horizon Scanning uh, Forum across a number of agencies, FDA, Japan, Health Canada, EMA, and we want to um, a, try to identify what is coming to agencies ahead of time. But we have also decided that we would do a number of deep dive exercises in order to make sure that we could test our systems and again try with the idea of trying to identify the expertise needed, not necessarily where we know it is. And the second one is really to see how much these challenges are current legal basis. We don't have the same one, it doesn't matter. Generally, the principles are quite similar and the challenges are probably common. Uh, it challenges our procedures, it challenges our way of thinking, and in the case of AI, it's particularly true. And uh, of course, I'm not going to repeat what we have been um, finding because you will see that it is actually extremely uh, similar to what has been presented in these two days. And we have a identify in our deep dive, which I'm going to explain a little bit more. We have identified a uh, ethical issues. Um, we have identified the need to understand the algorithm. We need to identify to a uh, be aware of what's behind the uh, proprietary data and how the algorithm are influencing what we are going to see. So um, this horizon scanning has been the, the basis for the deep dive. We have done a deep dive on genome editing. We are preparing one on microbiome and artificial intelligence has been the one that EMA has been leading. So how did we manage? We um, started by identifying two theoretical cases um, of using AI in two regulatory situations. And we went around our own agency, EMA, having a little bit of a brainstorming and, the, um, and trying to identify the maximum issues and benefits, not just the issues, of course, also the, the benefits. And we have done ask the participating uh, agencies, which are listed on this slide, to do the same exercise. So they went also through this and they complemented our initial report. So we, uh, the two theoretical cases that we used were one central nervous system app using AI, which was, depending on the discussion, either used to diagnose or assess a disease for the selection of patient, but we also envisaged a case where AI would be used to, for example, refine the product so its target is uh, different over time, depending on the rest therapeutic response, which is, as you will understand, a challenge for regulators. The second case was about use of AI in pharmacovision, and a lot has been said already about signal detection and increasing our capacity to um, analyze the amount of data. So I'd like to focus maybe more on the central nervous system because that has been quite, quite a challenge for us. Um, in terms of diagnosis of disease, this is maybe the obvious because as presented also before, this is increasing the human capacity. This is the best way probably to do it. We are there. Artificial intelligence can do a better job than the human eye or the human brain. So that is, is something quite, quite interesting. In terms of selection of patients, this is where already we start entering into the domain of changing the clinical trial paradigms. Because if on an ongoing basis you change the selection of patients, you lose what is the common approach, which is a homogeneous group that has been pre-selected independently of the treatment they are going to receive, and that will be analyzed at the end of the period of study. So we are talking about a sort of adaptive design, which will include a number of different endpoints, maybe, or different patient uh, um, selection. Um, we can, of course, measure with the app the adherence and the follow-up by, by a participant in the trial and the response to therapies. But at the same time, if we change on the way uh, to the end of the trial, what are we exactly measuring? When do we have enough patient to say that the system has delivered what we want? So there are lots of questions which for regulators who generally, and if I may uh, risk a joke, that regulators are not known to like change and to uh, um, evolve faster. Uh, so this is challenging the way we currently do 
a randomized controlled trial with parallel groups. So this is really uh, something that is uh, a, a challenging for us. If we change the endpoint, it's the same. We will have trouble. So this will impact the benefit risk as we measure it, and which is the basis for our approval to put the product on the market. So how do we cope with a changing benefit risk over a re relatively short period of time? This will also be the case in pharmacovigilance. Of course, if you change all the time the uh, safety information, you may change the benefit risk. When do you get the threshold by at which you say the benefit risk becomes negative? I will stop a, a marketing the product. So we have we have a number of challenges there. We, as I said also earlier, the second objective was to analyze where we can find the experts. So we have seen that we need to understand and regulators are not familiar with algorithm, with maybe a few exceptions, but this is not our job. So who is going to advise us on the algorithm? How much do we have access to this information? How much can we control this information? Do we validate this information? And these are all the questions that we will need to be answer, able to answer at some point in time. So it's really a, a, a big, a big challenge for for us as regulators. And these are the, the elements that have been shared with other regulators in the world. And a, even if there are already guidelines, we want at some point in time to put in common our challenges and the. John Mario was presenting earlier the <clears throat> sorry the international collaboration. This is also what we need to do to ensure convergence. Okay, so the preliminary recommendation went to uh, developing a framework to assess and validate AI. I'm not going to read uh, because I've already expressed the, the the concern we have, and at the same time. <clears throat> Sorry, the benefits we can see from AI, because we tend as regulators to always think about the risks and be risk averse, but we also can see the benefit because that will help us analyze a, a big amount of data that we need to be able to do, and maybe to standardize a little more approach to benefit risk, which is still very much empirical and subjective. So the international collaboration may go through ICMRA ICMRA is strategic in nature due to its uh, composition as head of agencies. So it will remain a sort of a thinking uh, body for what needs to be done at that level. But of course, there will be operational groups and uh, other groups. And it should be linked, of course, to the um, horizon scanning. The uh, development of guidelines will be necessary. This is our response to uh, issues in the regulatory world. And we know that there are already some guidelines out. Maybe they will need to change. Maybe we need AI to modify the guidelines. And uh, certainly the last point is not the, the least one for me, is to make sure that we have an ethical approach to AI, because um, it is out of question to uh, transform patients as objects and to transform the way we work in ignoring the uh, the human needs of the patient. So we have to find the balance between having a more objective decision and also being able to recognize that uh, the situations are not just a statistics and, and um, a decision making. So the next steps are we are now finalizing the report that we've done on this uh, deep dive on AI, and it will be adopted by all members. So ICMRE has a, a dual objective of working together, which is done by a number of agencies together, and then dissemination of this information to the others. And finally, then the implementation, the operational aspect will be left to each agency. But of course, we will continue exchanging to try to work together. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, that was definitely uh, informative and enjoyable. So thank you so much for giving us a review and some of the recommendations you had in there. Hopefully that will lead into good discussions uh, going into the roundtable later. Um, our next presentation is from Jörg uh, Sensenling from uh, Bee Farm in Germany uh, to speak to us about the Big Data uh, Training sur Survey. So uh, over to you, Jörg. Thanks, Jesper. Um... It's my pleasure to present um, on the Big Data Training Survey. 
which is um, EMA work. And um, I present this um, for the big data steering group. And I'm a member of that group as a representative of the uh, national competent authorities. And I'm also at um, EMA working parties. I will present um, concise um, and briefly um, results on AI aspects of that um, big data training survey. And the outline is um, I will present a bit of background connecting to what uh, Gian Mario was presenting, um, um, inform you on uh, objectives and participants, and um, present some preliminary results and conclusions. So the background is, um, as already mentioned, um, the development of um, EU network skills is one recommendation in the Big Data Steering Group work plan. And um, the existing training initiatives in the EU regulatory network um, uh, cover biostatistics and clinical trial methodology for regulators as a curriculum. Um, it covers use of real-world evidence for regulatory purposes as a curriculum, and there's a data literacy for regulatory purposes curriculum under development. Until finalization of these three planned curricula, there is a big data training signpost um, at the HMA um, website available, which is not yet tailored um, information for regulatory um, purposes, but provides some, some general training material. And the questions addressed by the uh, Big Data Training Survey are, are there gaps in the curricula and uh, which training modules should be prioritized? And the objectives in detail are um, validating the scope of the three mentioned curricula, um, helping to identify uh, big data skill gaps and uh, training needs, and um, as mentioned, obtain some feedback on the priorities. The survey was sent out to the experts in the regulatory network, which is um, quite an impressive number, um, almost 5,000. There were um, a, a quite a number of responses received. We have um, more than 800 um, um, contacts responding. And the distribution to the different domains is depicted on the slide. It, uh, is uh, mostly on in the human area, but also veter veterinary, and um, both are covered. And I would like to present you a general overview over some um, of the topics addressed with the survey. And um, this is for providing some context for the more specific topics, um, which I come to in a second. You can see on the left um, the reported level of proficiency with um, colors, the, the lightest colors from uh, no knowledge to novice to intermediate and advanced uh, for the darkest colors. Um, um, we have also some um, reporting themselves as experts which is fine. Um, on the right side, we see the um, perceived level of importance for the specific topics, from ranging from not important uh, to extremely important. And um, you can um, just glance through the topics. This is um, a general um, data interpretation, data analysis, data visualization, data management, um, governance, um, study design, and um, the last topic, um, the last row is on the big data, which 
might have um, the most relevance for for the um, workshop participants here. Um, before I switch to the next slide, I would um, like you to remember the um, darkness of the color on the left side and uh, the reported level of proficiency. Switching to the next slide, you can see that um, we now have for the um, relevant topics um, here, namely artificial intelligence, big data concepts, um, big data cloud solutions and IT tools, a much lighter colors, um, meaning that the reported level of proficiency for these important topics is uh, much lower than for the general uh, topics uh, you have seen on the previous slide. For the level of importance on the right side, um, you, you see that um, the, the level of importance is um, in the range of um, the general topics and um, uh, most participants report um, that the uh, importance of these topics is at least um, um, moderate or even higher. And focusing on, sorry, wrong direction, focusing on the most relevant topic on artificial intelligence, um, you see that the a large proportion of uh, respondents um, um, assess their knowledge um, as uh, quite low with no knowledge and novice uh, as the vast majority, uh, while um, the level of importance is um, rated quite high. And comparing to other skills um, re pertaining to big data as a uh, general concept and um, uh, IT and um, cloud solutions, um, this is uh, quite low level of proficiency um, reported. So in conclusion, um, for the topics I picked out as preliminary results, uh, big, on big data and artificial intelligence. The majority of the respondents um, have no knowledge or are novices with regard to the listed skills. The majority of respondents um, consider it at least moderately important to develop training modules in these skills. And there is uh, among respondents an apparent discrepancy between the reported skills and the perceived importance of artificial intelligence as a topic. And this um, will most likely um, uh, lead to uh, decisions on training. Thanks. And um, I would like to mention the acknowledgments. Um, this is uh, collaborative work um, from, from EMA. And if you have questions, you see um, the email addresses on the slide. Back to you, Jesper. Well, thank you so much, Jörg. And I think this really goes to the transparency and then and just the uh, realization of the knowledge we need to, to get and to become literate uh, within the field of, of AI and uh, within the network. And also to, to Agnes's point earlier, saying that there's, there's a true need for, for the experts to step into that. And I can only just foresee that that potential 4% of, uh, or down to even 1% of experts, but those being more massively really stretched thin across the entire network with the amount of support all of us. So, so it is a definite request for collaboration and for expanding this into even further knowledge within the network. Uh, so thank you very much, Jörg, for, for this, this very, very good overview of uh, all the key results we're serving. Um, we would actually now have scheduled a break, and I think we, we need to stay to that because 
at the, the next session, uh, we do have participants who can't join until the scheduled time, which is 20 minutes past four o'clock here in Central European time. So uh, I think I'll just allow everyone to have a little longer break uh, here during the afternoon and make sure you do get a good cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever uh, your preferred drink would be. And uh, then we will uh, be uh, joined back in again uh, for the continued work of the session today uh, at uh, 20 minutes past uh, four. So see you there later. Okay, dear colleagues, um, I'm just going to try to get this uh, session after the coffee break underway. Um, hopefully you managed to grab coffee after that last, uh, you know, uh, interesting session with a variety of viewpoints with regards to recommendations coming from all sorts of strategy, both European and international. My name is uh, Tony Humphreys, and uh, I'm, I'm working at the European Medicines Agency, and I'm heading up yet another task force complementing Peter's uh, on regulatory science and innovation. And I'm very grateful to have been invited by Peter to moderate um, this roundtable this afternoon. There's a very eminent uh, panel that's been assembled representing the diversity of stakeholder interests uh, that you'll be hearing from very shortly. And certainly they're a lot more knowledgeable on this topic than I am. Uh, so that's a relief to begin with. Um, in, in, in terms of the structure, uh, it's a four part structure. I will very shortly hand over to uh, my colleague, Luis Pinheiro, who will uh, walk you through the results of a survey that many of you may have contributed to with regards to, well, what do we do? You know, how do we solve a problem like artificial intelligence? How do we break it down? And he'll walk you through the recommendations and what people made of it. Thereafter, then, I will will throw it open to the panelists. And we have um, uh, a, a good, healthy number of panelists, 10 panelists to be precise, assuming everybody's online. And they will give their perspectives. I'll invite them to give their view on the priorities um, in sequence. After that, then it goes to an open session. It's a question and answer that we'll throw open to yourselves. Um, please use the um, uh, Q and A uh, chat chat sequence in the in the right of of the WebEx screen. And if I can issue a reminder already, and I will do again, can you identify at least your stakeholder grouping? And why is that important? It's not because we want to track you down. It's quite simply that we want to deliver a coherent response. So we're going to be able to field maybe amongst our panelists as to who is best positioned to give you a response. Uh, and as you can see, we also give written responses as well. So even if your question doesn't get answered for whatever reason, immediately live online, uh, be sure that at least it's contributing to the reflection on this topic. And we'll endeavor to, to uh, write it in the chat as, as a minimum. We'll then finish with a, a Slido poll of, of everybody online as to see where do we end up uh, at the end of, of this round table. So that's pretty much my sort of opening remarks. Uh, I hope you've been hearing me uh, well on, and it will be uh, good now if I can pass on the um, floor to Luis and ask invite him to present the results then of the uh, survey. So Luis, over to you, please. Well, thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I have a very uh, quick uh, overview of the survey results um, that I'd like to share with you. And I will start with this slide, which has basically the uh, most um, positive responses as green. So four and five categories are green. And the ones and twos are um, orange and yellow. And you'll see uh, the ranking here of the recommendations. And the first, the highest, is develop a framework to assess and validate artificial intelligence. And the second highest is international collaborations. And engaging with experts is the last one. Now, you can see that uh, it kind of tapers off uh, gently, except the bottom two, experimentation with artificial intelligence and influence research priorities do not seem to be a high priority for the responders. Another way of looking at this is just looking at the top priority. So 
um, how many people clicked on five for each of those. And here again, develop a framework to assess and validate AI is the top, but you'll see that make regulatory data open appears in the top three now, uh, whereas in the previous slide, it was um, around middle of the table. Now, um, you also see that influence research priorities again appears uh, very much at the bottom. So clearly not something that the respondents um, felt was um, relevant. I didn't stratify, because we don't have time, we didn't stratify by a stakeholder, but you can see that is pretty much, so this is just the rank of each of these recommendations by stakeholder, and you see the wiggly lines moving uh, back and forward here. So clearly, um, the recommendations, um, different stakeholder groups prioritize recommendations slightly different. And um, actually the only thing that we can see is, is a very straightforward is the low um, priority for influencing research priorities for funders. So all in all, uh, it's clear that developing a framework to assess and validate AI is um, a, a very um, important priority for the responders. Uh, and then it kind of changes depending on how you look at it it kind of changes the top three if you're looking exclusively at the five or if you're looking at the highest priorities of so category four and five. Okay, so this is a very short um, uh, presentation of the survey and I'll pass back to you, Tony, to get us started in the panelist session. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, dear colleagues, uh, many thanks for that, Luis. And indeed, uh, we now move over to to consult our panel, sort of um, get their directions on this prioritization exercise. So, as explained, maybe at the heads up, it's it's to invite each panelist um, to reflect on the fifteen or so recommendations that have been identified to date through a, the various strategy documents, but to identify you know, two to three of those recommendations that you consider would be the most impactful and the one that would deliver the greatest degree of change in this area, like benefiting the system in Europe, if not even uh, in, in the global development type of context, and that you suggest that we should invest in, you know, rather rapidly over, over the next couple of years. And certainly in, in the prep of this session, we also were not so arrogant to think that we've, you know, identified all of the recommendations without exclusion. So there is essentially a wild card option, but it's not a sort of two to three plus the wild card, it's uh, two to three, including a wild card. So if you feel like doing a wild card, introducing a recommendation that you don't believe has been identified to date, please do so. And uh, we'll be very interested to hear. And I'm, I'm going to be asking all of the panelists to try to do that in, in a sort of two to three minute time slot. And I'll give them a sort of 60 second warning at the end to close just to keep things moving along. So if I can invite my first panelist, and it's um, Lisbeth Brenwart from the uh, Danish agency, and she is an inspector working in the Danish agency, so obviously representing the regulatory system. So Elizabeth, if you're able to rise to that challenge and give us your perspective now on the two to three recommendations you believe should be prioritized, please. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And um, I'm definitely happy to be part of this as well. So thanks first for inviting and, and thanks also for the initiative. I think it's extremely important. Um, we have a few points that we want to also share from an inspector's view, uh, which talks into the um, the network where we need to cooperate more, I think. So I, I assume my reason for being here just short is I, I've been a GCP inspector of the uh, Danish Medicines Agency for 15 plus years. Um, in, in that period, also part of the electronic subgroup of the GCP Inspectors Working Group of the EU. We are responsible for drafting the guidance and um, uh, on electronic systems and electronic data. And I'm also involved in, in um, currently revising the E6, where we are taking into account new, new data types and new types of system, new types of trials. So, so uh, thank you. So the disclaimer is also, of course, that I'm talking on behalf of myself. I can't represent all these uh, good people. So the two to three topics I've chosen is uh, two from the top, I think, and one from lower um, down in, in the survey we just saw. First, um, 
the first one for me is is uh, putting some regulatory expectations, and and I have it from you know, the, the numerous requests we receive from stakeholders about giving regulatory guidelines, uh, coming out and clarifying regulatory expectations, um, and uh, I thought that the the, th the topics were very interlinked and overlapping, so it was difficult to choose, but this one takes priority for me. Um, and luckily, I mean, we quickly realized we had to take some initiatives. So one of the initiatives we've taken from the GDP inspectors working group point of view is a, a joint workshop with the FDA and stakeholders from SCDM and eClinical Forum. And we had a, in September, we had a, a workshop about use cases of AI and also starting to to talk about expectations and we'll have another uh, workshop later uh, this year. And the other initiative I, I would like to also quickly mention is that we in the Danish Medicines Agency, we, we think we need to take it a bit further and, and react uh, quickly on this. Um, so we de developed a set of criteria for um, AI and machine learning practices that we want to, we put it, we, we put it out for publication. It's our uh, IT inspector, Ibel Slope, who is responsible and he's also on the call. So feel free to, to chat any questions to him regarding this. So development of guidelines is hugely important and it, it brings me also to the international uh, cooperation. Um, and I think uh, Kea yesterday mentioned that is our uh, regulatory setup even, you know, uh, fit for purpose when it comes to giving guidance and on on novel things? Uh, but I think we we really need to to uh, to take on the challenge and and at least get started on this because it it is um, needed out there. So international co collaboration, also because we need. Uh, to not have diverse opinions between the the different regulatory uh, um, bodies here, and that brings me actually to my third um, priority, which is which was a little bit lower on the the, the list, um, and th this is about addressing ethical aspects of artificial intelligence, and one of the reasons I've picked that is that it's. Um, we can see, for instance, currently with all the decentralized trials, use of electronic systems and clinical trials, that one of the big obstacles is actually things like data protection. Um, and it's also important to start discussing what are the informed consents required. So uh, for passing on information, accessing uh, registry data, electronic healthcare data, um, um, and, and I would say one strong recommendation for me to, to us all is to maybe also start getting some of the data protection bodies aboard because we're talking about real roadblocks uh, on, um, in several contexts here. So, so I would strongly recommend that. Um, and I don't think it's fair to stakeholders actually if different regulatory bodies do not provide the clarity that is needed for them to start using uh, artificial intelligence. So from an inspector's perspective, especially for GCP, we, we very often see um, the challenges a little bit too late because we go out and inspect uh, clinical trials when they come in as a part of a marketing authorization application. Um, at, at which point in time it, the, the trial is closed, the, the tools have been used, and, and then we come and criticize. So this time we've, we've tried to take in a little bit of, of a more proactive um, uh, position. So, so again, let me just mention the, the meeting later this year, which is, uh, by the way, um, chaired by my BFAM colleague, Thorsten Stemler, who believe I, I believe is also on this call. So. Um, I think those would be my three recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks, Elizabeth. Proactive regulators, I'm sure everybody loves to hear that as a concept like, you know, long may it live. As you can see there, Luis is, is attempting to capture ideas live on, on the uh, whiteboard. So let's see, uh, you had the pleasure to break the ice on this. So let's see how it develops. So if I can hand over now then to uh, 
Pater uh, Reinbeck, and, and uh, he's obviously coming from the research uh, background, and I believe we've heard from him earlier on in this conference. So please, Pater, if I can invite you now to give your perspective in terms of top two to three recommendations, wildcard if you wish, please. Sure. Yeah, I think the list of priorities, uh, of course, they're all interesting, but there is a clear dependency between the different priorities, so we need to tackle them in the right order. And therefore, I think that building partnerships with academia and research centers is actually a first step uh, because we need to train people. And uh, I think it will be very important to build expertise uh, in the agency and the stakeholder community as a whole on the topic, as it was also shown by the training survey, I think, uh, earlier today. Um, so there's much value in building capacity for uh, education for medical experts themselves as well on what a predict predictive model actually is and, and how to use it. And the same is true for us researchers and of course the regulators. Um, so that will be my first priority, building a strong relationship with academia and research to use that for the second one, which is uh, creating the guidelines. And I think the ultimate goal of our research is to improve patient care, patient health and for that we need to apply our tools in clinical practice um, and that naturally leads into the goal of guidelines we need recommendations for ai uh, building on the great effort that was already done initially internationally of course by the by the fda uh, so it will be very important to identify types of ai applications and their levels of required regulation. And I think that's still not very clear. Um, and these guidelines should really guide on how to continuously monitor AI algorithms uh, when placed into clinical care under some sort of medical device vigilance system. And that brings me to my third point that um, we need capacity. So we cannot uh, enforce regulations and, and test algorithms if we don't have the data. Uh, so we need to build capacity for extensive validation of AI uh, algorithms, as I also shared yesterday in my presentation, that's really lacking, uh, to assure that these models are trained on one data set, work also on other data, and potentially even uh, in other settings. Uh, and in that respect, I think uh, model fairness will also need to have proper attention. Uh, to make sure that the model works well in each different type of population. So for that, we need large databases um, to assess uh, in population subgroups uh, and also in multiple clinical settings. So the right order for me is uh, interact with, with the research center, then build the guidelines, and based on the guidelines and the requirements there, build enough capacity to, uh, to validate the models at scale. Thanks very much for that, Peter. And on that sort of building relationship with academia and researchers, it's a good link then into allow me to introduce Mark Loyler from Queen's University Belfast and I invite him to sort of continue the reflection with regards to your top two to three recommendations, please, Mark. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, Federation of European Academies of Medicine, or FEM, is the European umbrella group that represents 23 national academies and over 4,000 experts from medical, veterinary, pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, digital health and AI are key areas of focus for FEM, and we plan an event on this team in the autumn. Uh, we have identified three key areas which we feel should be prioritised in order to ensure that AI is really embedded in the procedures and the practices of medicine regulation as we go forward. And the first of these brings together two of the recommendations, uh, the establishment of a multi-stakeholder forum on health data science and AI, and also the establishment of an EMA expert group on AI. We really need to capture the views and expertise of a diverse group of stakeholders because we need to look at the technical, ethical, legal, regulatory, scientific, and most importantly, societal perspectives on the use of these digital technologies. One thing that disappointed me in the recommendations was that there was no mention of patients or citizens. Patients and citizens must, and I emphasize this, must be active participants in this multi-stakeholder forum. We also need to ensure that sufficient expertise is available within the EMA expert group on AI, with a particular emphasis on accelerated analytics, ethical AI, and the use of real-world evidence. The second area we'd like to highlight relates to the development of appropriate frameworks that identify two critical components of AI and medicines regulation. The first, assessment and validation of AI, and the second, the development of guidelines. 
So developing a framework to assess and validate AI, we feel is a critical component of really embedding AI within the regulatory process for medicines, and we would strongly support its implementation. Developing such a robust and assessment and validation framework will be particularly important to support AI enabled clinical trials and real world evidence clinical studies. Similarly, the recommendation to build a framework to support the development of guidelines is one that very much resonates with us. So it allows us to be an enabling mechanism to ensure that AI is very much to the fore in empowering timely, effective and robust medicines regulation. The final area that we would like to highlight relates to partnership and cooperation. Only by working together can we really achieve what is required in this AI digital health space. So the recommendation to build partnerships with academic and medical research uh, centers is an important one, plays very much into our network of over 4,000 medical and life science experts across Europe. But we want to push even further and also highlight the res res recommendation to support international collaborations, ensuring that we really bring the best minds and expertise to bear to address the undoubted challenge that we will face and that we will continue to face going forward. We are at a crucial infection point in the regulation of medicines, made all the more real by the current pandemic and by the societal need for a rapid response to deliver effective medicines and vaccines. AI and digital health offer tantalizing opportunities to really introduce a step change in medicines regulation. It is incumbent on us to grasp these opportunities while maintaining ethical probity and ensuring the safety of our citizens. Thank you, Tommy. Okay, no, ma many thanks for that, Mark, very clear. And I, I, I was quite struck by your, your appeal to the fact that we need to involve both citizens and patients, and I think we're gonna be hearing from them shortly. So that was a good connection then to introduce uh, Yelena Malina uh, from the Consumer Association Buick to speak on behalf of the consumers. So Yelena, if I can invite you to take the floor now, please. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, so, our top priority is building comprehensive and binding legal framework for artificial intelligence, which would set clear rules on how to assess and validate AI, but also ensures um, artificial intelligence tools transparency, auditability and non-discrimination. And it's in addition to building that, we also need to look at um, AI in the context of our current legal system in a wider way. So we need to look at consumer safety liability laws, whether they're fit for purpose, and if they're not, then we need to review them accordingly. Um, of course, we need to address ethical aspects of AI because ethics is a fundamental basis of medical science, and it has been like this um, for many years. But we also want to warn against relying solely on ethical guidelines because we can have hundreds of different approaches uh, and discussions on what is ethical, what is less ethical. But from the user perspective, what we really, really need is enforceable and universal rules uh, which would support patient and consumer rights when it comes to AI users. And of course, AI deployment and overall digitalization must go ha hand in hand with uh, development of digital skills. And um, not only for consumers, not only for patients, but also for researchers, for healthcare professionals, for policymakers. Um, and we all must be aware, aware of our digital rights as much as we're aware of our human rights. And therefore, the investment must uh, not only be um, towards the technology development, but also uh, to enhance our societal digital skills. Um, and we believe that this would also help to develop overall trust in artificial intelligence and uh, conscience, conscious and sustainable use of these technologies. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's absolutely smashing, Yelena. Thank you very much for that. And now to get a view, I think, from the medtech sector, if we can invite Danny Van Royen to uh, take the floor and give us your own perspective on the top two recommendations. Danny, please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yes, Danny Van Royen from Cosier, uh, representing medical device and medical software manufacturers. Um, thanks for this opportunity to provide the insights and the experience we have from from the medtech industry. Um, so we, of course, uh, most of our members are being uh, developing AI-based applications and, and products that are 
coming within the scope of the new upcoming medical device regulation, which already provides a legal regulatory framework, and that will be further complemented, no doubt, tomorrow by the new AI legislative proposal by the European Commission. Um, so, so in a way, some of the um, things that have been raised yesterday and today around um, some of the safeguards or, or the framework that is necessary for AI in, in AI medicine is what we already have or, or expect to have uh, for the medical devices. Um, that's why I would like to focus on, on basically true, uh, three principles uh, that I believe are, are common to whether it's AI in, in medicine, specific for, for pharma or for, for medical devices. And that is around the principles of trust, validation, and integration. Um, and uh, although we, we have uh, a legal framework for, for the medical devices that quite clearly uh, puts up requirements for, for safety, for reliability, uh, also some aspects related to bias and has a risk-based and life cycle approach, um, still there, there's quite a, a lack or, or a difficulty in accessing high quality data. And in that sense, we are very much looking forward to the European Commission's work on the European health data space. And we're also very uh, interested to see what will happen with the Darwin EU project. That will help to, to provide this kind of pool of, of health data, high quality, where we believe there's also a purpose for AI to have uh, these kind of um, sort of standardized data sets that will be able to, to help benchmark AI-based applications to ensure that they, they have good uh, training data sets and they can also be um, independently, independently validated so that it's also more clear, for instance, for healthcare professionals uh, to what extent the um, AI will perform in, in a real setting. Uh, that also brings me to the integration part. Um, pretty much in, 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 in contradiction of the priorities that have been put forward uh, in, in, in this kind of mini survey, uh, we do believe there's a strong need for, for experimentation and sandbox uh, because we see right now that a lot of the AI applications are, are quite narrow and focusing on one specific element, but they need to be integrated into the workflows which means that uh, they need to be able to work together with other systems, with the healthcare professionals, of course. Um, so we think that there's quite a lot of need in, in having this kind of experimentation and testing facilities, living labs where AI-based applications can be tested and further fine-tuned. And then lastly, but not uh, least uh, less important, is the trust and multi-stakeholder dialogue with patients, with citizens, with healthcare professionals um, to get a better understanding of the actual needs and also how to address this with, with the solutions, raise more awareness on uh, what is possible and what is not with AI because there's a lot of uh, confusion and misunderstandings. Uh, also to highlight uh, some of the issues around the explainability or, or the boundaries of use. Um, so these are, let's say, the, the three main issues that we, we feel are important, uh, both from, from AI in medicine as from a medical device uh, perspective. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks very much. I, I was quite curious to hear your remarks on, on the, the prioritization for the sandboxes, because indeed, in the European Commission's pharma strategy, sandbox uh, for regulatory experiments is very much identified as, as a novel idea that, that we're being invited to consider. So maybe we reflect on that more, more generally. And, and then having heard then from the view from the consumers with Yelena, it's a pleasure then to introduce Marilena Vrana from the patient organizations to extend that reflection then from the patient's perspective. So, Marilena, if I can invite you the same on your two to three top recommendations, please. Thank you, Tony. And we heard that several times yesterday from uh, various representatives that um, uh, and the European Commission in the commitment of uh, quality data. This is, this is, we feel, a key prerequisite uh, 
um, because the existing variability in quality in electronic health records, uh, registries, and other data sources have certain limitations and may contain unquantifiable bias that may impact the trustworthiness and trust in AI algorithms. Um, so directly to the priorities, our first priority will also relate to the development of a framework to assess and validate AI. But this we see it combined with um, a, a promoted transparency and audible uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence development is, we've seen it's moving much faster than validation, whether that is a scientific validation or, re or regulatory validation. And, um, and that will be key for their reliability and important for patients to trust them in the future, especially if they are to be used for co-deciding or taking decision about which treatment pathways they should take. So AI developers should provide evidence de demonstrating how algorithms have been externally validated, what quality assessment was performed, and transparency is essential so that regulators and independent entities can scrutinize the data. Stewardship and regular surveillance of AI is also important to, to ensure that uh, um, artificial intelligence tools remain fit for purpose. A second priority relates to skills, and there are two priorities in skills, which I was happy to see that also in the EMA presentation were grouped in one. So developing the capability and upskilling the EMA and the regulatory network is important. Uh, regulatory authorities must have the ability to interrogate large data sets and be able to assess quality, security, and providence of the data uh, used in big data analytics and artificial intelligence. So capacity building is crucial, and there I would put collaboration for capacity building is also very important, including a diverse set of stakeholders. Last but not least, our third priority uh, relates to a framework for early engagement with end users of AI. Unfortunately, in the priorities list as end users, only healthcare professionals are listed, but there, the, the, the inclusion of patients is critical, as, as other colleagues mentioned before. Early engagement and co-creation is a powerful method to take into account specific issues, whether these are concerns or expectations of end users regarding the use of AI in health and, medicines and medicinal regulatory processes. So co-creation and shared decision-making um, will ensure AI's efficacy and trustworthiness, um, as well as data uh, protection. Finally, you mentioned we could raise a wild card. I don't know if this is a wild card that I'm going to raise, but I think in, a, in, a legislative, in legislation, I think it's important to address. And that relates to um, liability. Um, Clear guidance is needed uh, for the future on who will be who will be liable, who will be responsible for AI-driven healthcare decision made. So, for example, uh, who is accountable when an algorithm suggests an intervention that might be dangerous or expensive, and is later proven that it was useless? So what are our rights? Uh, what are our rights when uh, when the use of AI leads to wrong diagnosis or wrong treatments? Will they be the AI provider, the healthcare professional, the regulator, the regulators who have approved uh, this method? So these are issues that would need to be tackled in, in legislation in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Marilyn. And absolutely, that's a fantastic wild card to finish on because indeed it's uh, it's an absolute minefield potentially to navigate as to where that liability rests. We're already trying to get our heads around sort of convergence of pharmaceuticals with med tech more generally, and you throw in some software applications into the middle of all of that. It's it's a wonderful challenge to reflect upon, but I mean it's it's where we're at at the moment, that's for sure. So indeed, then just just moving from the patients then to get the perspective then on the healthcare professionals, you know, and also you know supremely interested in the development and application of this topic. And it's a pleasure for me then to invite uh, Johanna Agash to actually um, address the top two to three recommendations on behalf of that stakeholder group. So please, Johanna, if I may invite you, please. 
Thank you, Tony. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. It's one year now since I joined the Big Data Steering Group, and it was quite a learning curve. So it's it's uh, it's a very important for us. Uh, it's a very important field for healthcare professionals from better diagnosis using multiple tools in, in multiple tools in an unbiased approach, uh, leading to better outcomes from drug discovery to real world evidence of effectiveness and the um, <clears throat> safety. Of course, moving to digital therapeutics is um, where for us it's very complicated because we have a double jeopardy with health data literacy because it's first health literacy and then with data literacy is what we are trying to implement as <clears throat> novel AI. Now, our um, our proposals uh, are pretty much close to the research ones. So uh, first, uh, we bet on building partnerships academia and research centers and this is because we need innovation all these AI models will need to be translated into useful clinical decision support system and we can do this only through an open dialogue within all of us the second priority will be to promote a transparent and auditable AI because we really need intensive external validation and we need to share models in order to test them and to improve them all the time and the third priority for us will be to develop a framework to assess and validate AI. Because we need, as was said yesterday, excellence in data quality. This digital knowledge database can has to be done on solid ground. We need urgently standardized health data in terms of extraction and terminology, and we also need to train and test all these models across different healthcare systems. Thank you, over to you. Many thanks for that, Iona. Really good. And and now we're sort of bridging back then to the um, developer side of things, moving into the industry. And if I can invite Kelly Zhu to kick off with that before handing over then to uh, Douglas thereafter. So Kelly, please, if you kick off. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to summarize. Um, the perspective of Pharma's focus is for the purpose of medicines regulation particularly in terms of drugs versus devices. Whilst our acknowledgement is that AI can be broadly and deeply applicable end to end. We have narrowed down to the top three choices from uh, those 15 themes. So our first choice is to develop a framework to assess and validate AI. It is important to develop such a framework and use a risk-based approach leading to regulatory guidance. We not only look forward to the regulatory frameworks for AI used in randomized controlled trials, such as those using digital endpoints, but also in pragmatic clinical studies, post-approval safety studies, and non-interventional observational studies to harness real-world data. Our second choice is make regulatory data open. To be able to evaluate AI in medicines regulation, for example, through explainable AI or XAI versus black box type of algorithms, it is critical to be able to search for fit for purpose, open regulatory databases, have international standards, and visualize and validate results using data sources while protecting data security and patient privacy. For example, the HMA and EMA um, recently hosted a metadata technical workshop on data cataloging. Our third choice is international collaboration. It is imperative to adhere to the international guidelines such as the ICH, as well as gaining a clear understanding of the definitions via guidelines with respect to AI. Such collaboration is useful when considering global regulatory purposes, such as label expansion in multiple jurisdictions, and to be able to assess regulatory use cases. The FDA's CDRH has published 90 publicly available examples of different types of regulatory submissions supported by RWE recently. Finally, our pharma representatives acknowledge that all themes are important, but may overlap. So we also recommend clarification on one, definition and ap applications of AI. Second, purpose of AI for drugs regulation versus devices regulation. 
thirdly, availability of the quality data to be fed into AI algorithms. Thank you. That's uh, smashing, Kelly. Thank you very much for that. Um, and, and then if I can invite in, uh, Douglas Gregory then from BMS uh, to continue the industry reflection, please, Douglas. Uh, thanks very much, Tony. I'm speaking on behalf of Digital Europe uh, this afternoon, which represents the digital technology industry across Europe. Our members include over 85 of the world's largest IT, health and manufacturing companies, as well as 39 national associations from every part of Europe, representing 36,000 small and medium-sized enterprises. As others have said already to, uh, this afternoon, the frameworks, the legal frameworks for AI, GDPR, digital governance, and the upcoming and future uh, European health data space will condition the ability of the EMA and HMA to move forward. And the EU needs to get these legal frameworks right. That being said, the European regulatory network will not remain a top regulator, top tier regulator, without addressing digitalization and data, analy data analytics. Uh, from our perspective, AI should not be seen in isolation or separate from digitalization. Before we can adopt AI across the network, we need to make sure that national drug regulators have the capabilities and resources to manage large data sets. So here are our following uh, key priorities. Uh, first off, the development of a framework to assess and validate AI. Others have said it, other, and we agree with the rationale that others are putting forward, so I won't repeat that. We have seen from yesterday's presentation the importance of member state, European and international perspectives. And so from our perspective, that means that collaboration across the network and internationally is essential. And finally, the uh, EU regulatory network is a decentralized system. It is not a unitary agency. Some national regulators are more advanced than others. Uh, NCA budgets will vary from member state to member state. We need to ensure that there are sufficient resources in all uh, 27 competent authorities to ensure that the network has the computing capacity to receive, store, and interrogate health data. It is for these reasons that Digital Europe supports efforts to upskill the EMA and EU regulatory network and to develop the capacity to validate AI algorithms. However, we may need to reconsider how the network develops expertise in the future. Perhaps we should consider a move towards an expertise-led network where an agency or a group of agencies could lead in a particular area. Finally, we should be precise when dealing with artificial intelligence and tailor its use to individual tasks that it was meant to perform. Let's build on uh, successes. Only when artificial intelligence applications are detailed and specific can the network begin to discuss their utility and their risks. Hopefully this workshop has been able to provide everyone with a sense of the scope of where AI is being used and where it might be used in the future. Again, Tony, my thanks on behalf of Digital Europe for being invited to contribute to your deliberations. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Douglas. And, and um, if, if I move on now to my, my last panelist, certainly by no means least, it's uh, Larry O'Dwyer, and he's uh, the chair of the EU Innovation Network and has to reflect on all of this wonderful wave of technology and, and, and uh, science that sort of is hitting the system. It's a nice challenge to have. So, Larry, if I can invite you to reflect on, on, on what you've heard and, and from your perspective, then what the top two to three recommendations and or a wild card as you wish uh, to close out the panel, please. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for the opportunity. And as Tony has mentioned, I'm here today in my role as co-chair of the EU Innovation Network. And our group brings together representatives from innovation offices in national competent authorities right across the EU and representatives from the EMA's Innovation Task Force. And some of the key aims of our group are to identify emerging trends that may require new or amended regulatory tools or approaches and to contribute to that consolidation of an EU medicines regulatory network view on innovations falling within our regulatory unit. As such, a number of EUIN members have participated in the regulatory initiatives that you've heard about earlier this afternoon and are also in, in attendance at this workshop, reflecting our significant interest in this important topic. So the recommendations are certainly interlinked and they're each, each important in their own right. But the following are the three recommendations that I would like to personally highlight. The first would be to develop a framework to assess and validate AI. 
And clearly this is timely as we are waiting for publication of the European Commission's horizontal regulation proposal in relation to AI. And the pharmaceutical strategy published by the Commission last year also acknowledged the need to review and revise the pharmaceutical legislation to ensure that it reflects scientific and technological progress. And that includes the digital transformation facilitated in part by AI. AI does require us to adapt our existing regulatory tools and approaches and to consider new ones. The constantly evolving and dynamic nature of AI is a particular challenge from a regulatory perspective, and we need to adapt to, to reflect this. So concepts such as the predetermined change control plan or good machine learning or good simulation practices need to be developed further and embedded in our regulatory decision making. We also know it's important to harmonize the terminology to you know, make sure we're talking the same language to each other to ensure a patient-centred and ethical approach with appropriate transparency to users and to ensure that appropriate measures are in place to address potential biases and ensure robustness. I would very much agree that the development of the framework needs to be done in conjunction with all relevant stakeholders, as other speakers in this panel have already highlighted. And there is also a need to ensure a proportionate approach, which takes into account the circumstances in which AI is being used and ultimately is based on the potential impact on the patient. The second recommendation I would like to highlight is the need to upskill the EMA and the EU regulatory network in general. And that relates, in my view, to both capacity and expertise. Contributors during the workshop have already highlighted the rapid expansion in the use of AI over recent years, and that is going to pose capacity challenges. And in terms of expertise, we need to optimize the use of the existing exp expertise within the network. AI can be applied in different areas throughout the life cycle of the product, as we've seen in this workshop during early stage product development, in clinical trials with the subsequent data feeding into MA applications, and post-marketing to support the use of real-world data, signal detection, and safety monitoring. So there's going to be a need for experts on AI to work together with the appropriate regula regulatory experts in each of these areas to ensure effective and appropriate regulation of the AI-based approaches. And of course, as regulators, we also need to consider how we can use AI for our benefit, such as, for example, automated literature monitoring, which can free up resources to work in other areas. The third recommendation I'd like to highlight is the need to engage with experts. And I deliberately chose this one because it didn't necessarily define who those experts are. And I think we need to take steps to ensure that we as regulators can access the best expertise across Europe and internationally. Contributors from academia and industry have spoken about the need to collaborate when developing AI-based applications. And we've seen the biopharmaceutical industry work in partnerships with techno technology companies. It's not realistic for regulators to expect to have all of the expertise or knowledge in-house. We need to consult with others and we need to have a multi-stakeholder dialogue when developing regulatory tools and approaches related to AI. And events such as this workshop show the value and importance of such dialogue. Finally, in my view, we need to collaborate with relevant experts in other agencies and in other regulatory networks, for example, in the medical devices network. Noting, of course, that a number of national competent authorities have a remit for both medicinal products and medical devices, which can facilitate that collaboration. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thanks very much. Like a very good way to close it out at this stage, at least. And um, Insofar as I understand from, from my, my, my uh, co-partner in crime on this particular session, Luis, he's been actually putting all of these priorities up on the whiteboard that we've been able to see on the screen. Um, I, I don't know whether um, Luis wishes just to talk us through where we've ended up now with regards to that process, Just uh, and that's an invitation. I'm also keeping an eye on, on the Q&A chat, and there's already been a couple of questions opened out, and indeed, some of the panelists have already started to respond. So we can sort of backtrack over one or more of those, but I would also encourage those online to fire some more questions online because uh, uh, otherwise, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the purpose now to throw it open for your own sort of queries um, as, as to where we're going with this, this topic. So please uh, use the uh, Q&A function and hopefully then we'll be able to get you some coherent responses then from this very diverse panel that we have at our disposal this afternoon. But Luis, if you can maybe just say a few things about what's the state of play with regards to the uh, whiteboard, please, over. Yes, thank you, Tony. It's a great discussion so far. And uh, I'd like to point out um, maybe two, three of the most commonly mentioned recommendations, and um, those are build partnerships with academia and research centers. 
building the framework that supports the development of guidelines and developing a framework to assess and validate AI. Um, we hear um, very often as well attached to it that collaboration and engaging with the stakeholders is important. And of course, um, people tie in those to the recommendations they're making because they can't do those in isolation. So in a sense, uh, um, a lot of the speakers are adding in the collaboration as a kind of a, 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 a as kind of a, an extra recommendation in, which I think makes makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's good to see that it matches quite nicely uh, with the survey results that we we did um, before the workshop. Okay, many thanks for that then, Luis. Um, if if I can then go into the Q and A, and I'm just trying to work out uh, just from the screen that I see. I think the first question that's been asked there is is um, uh, it's important to have appropriate guidelines that support transition from clinical development using APP AI in drug development MA evaluation by the regulators, and even more commercialization of drugs where AI continue to be used in the clinic. And I think that's the end of the question. I think Elizabeth, you, you've already responded in the chat on that, but I don't know whether, you know, maybe to kick us off, if you just want to develop your response or repeat your response uh, live so that we can uh, st support a discussion on, on that point that one of the colleagues has raised, please. Yeah, so, so I agree that, that, I mean, we're looking into a lot of different types uh, or at least uh, different processes of artificial intelligence and at the different time points in uh, the medicinal product from, from discovery of new drugs and until maybe post-marketing uh, uh, surveillance. Um, so it's it's hugely important to have the criteria right. And, and what I didn't say before, because as I said, I'm a GCP inspector, but I mean, there's really no reason why um, there should be specific criteria to clinical trials, for instance. I mean, it should be for, for critical decision-making purposes, no matter where we are in the process, there should be criteria. Um, so I think that's one thing I would like to say. One thing in addition, that uh, though for clinical trials is that I, I don't think we would expect initially for clinical trials to see uh, deep learning systems which continuously develop uh, without necessarily uh, human interaction because we don't want to be in the situation where we have a clinical trial and we don't really know. I mean, we, we're trying the medicinal product at the same time as we're trying a, a, an AI algorithm and we really want to be able to distinguish between the two. So uh, that's just one additional comment I wanted to make. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Do, do any of the other panelists want to join in on that particular topic, please? Uh, let me know if you do, or just take the take the mic. Um, just just to agree, uh, Tony, um, in relation to like we need to look at AI and the continuum of care. Yes, clinical trials and real world evidence is important, but I, you know, I think there are going to be lots of different opportunities if we use it wisely and constructively and obviously transparently and in a, an ethical fashion. But I, I do agree. I think my area in particular is cancer and really you have to look at it along the continuum of care. So with that continuum of care, there should also be a continuum of AI and digital health that, that sort of mirrors what the, the pathway is for patients. Hello. Thank you very much for that, Mark. And if, if we move on, there's another question that's come up, and it's um, from industry, basically. Uh, it's an easy one. Can you clarify what opening regulatory data means? Uh, how would it be accessible and by whom? And the proposal said non-sensitive regulatory data. What regulatory data would be considered non-sensitive or not to be sensitive? So. Uh, that's that's a, that's an incredible. I mean, that's an incredibly broad question. I seem to remember the the, the academic uh, amongst us are very strong on this point, and not the only ones. But I don't know if, if if there's anybody there from the panel that would like to kick off by way of a response. This is Kelly Zhou. Um, I represent the pharma industry, and uh, that is uh, one of our top three priorities. I think when we mention about open the regulatory data, 
it is really, first of all, uh, really following the patient data protection, for example, GDPR, and also the ethics, right? And uh, secondly, I think uh, right now, um, in order to really develop those AI solutions, it's really important to have multiple data sources. I think at the HMA EMA's metadata catalog discussion uh, earlier last week, that's really thinking about when we open such data, what will be the channel? Who will be able to access? Is this through partnerships? And, um, and know how can you really standardize uh, the data format? And uh, for example, whether you use OMAP model or some other ways, and then how do you visualize the data? What is the interaction between the end users of data and also the regulatory agencies and multiple different countries' data sources? So there are many sort of questions associated with this, but we hope that um, data can be available for regulatory purposes, and that will really require uh, not only collaborations, but also multi-stakeholder partnerships. Many thanks for that, uh, Kelly. And anybody else like to join in on this topic, and in particular, what type of data are we talking about? Tony, if I can come yeah, I can. I... Oops, sorry. I'll, I'll let Peter, oh, sure. Peter take the floor. Uh, sure. Yeah, no, no, I think it's, it would be extremely interesting if we can build a data network that can both be used by the regulator and all the other stakeholders. So we are using the same type of data, standardized in some way. Um, and I think that, that if you ask about the type of data, I think it should be very broad, depending on the AI algorithm that you're testing, you need different types of data. Uh, so the network should be not on not on a, should be actually be on a European level uh, different types of databases standardized preferably to a, a common data model that allows us to have standardized analytics to assess but also to build AI applications in the future. Yeah, I, I would agree. And um, Kelly mentioned the OMOP model earlier, and there are a number of other models as well. And the other thing to think about is obviously the use of synthetic data. Um, to test AI algorithms and, and again having sort of you know specific um, characteristics of that data that allow us to actually you know use it across right across the system. And what you don't want is to have 50 different models, 50 different types of data, and we're trying to you know generate you know something that we can really use from a regulatory point of view. So so that sort of coming together is, is really important. No, many thanks for that, Mark and Peter. Anyone else on this one, or we move on to the next? I'll, I'll move on then. Um, and, and this is a, a challenging one, as always, the, the whole area, potentially. Can, can you clarify the, the interplay or difference between the recommendations for developing a framework that supports guideline development and developing a framework for assessing or validating AI? Is is one more driven at the EU level versus member state, or does one precede the other? So that's the difference between recommendations for developing a framework on guidance development vis-a-vis -a, -vis a framework for assessing or validating AI itself. So who wants to kick off on that? I can start. Um... So I think the key difference between the guidelines and the framework is that one is legally binding and another one is not. So when we speak about guidelines, of course, they are necessary, and especially in the context of technology, which is developing rapidly and we can't really have a law which would uh, set everything in stone for years to come because we don't review laws um, every three months, every year, or even two, two years. It's a much longer period of time. and. Um, when we think about uh, AI deployment overall, we would need both. So we would need both the framework um, and, for, for instance, assessing and validating is especially important because it's part, if we think about the treatment or the device or anything, there is a setup process. Um, and uh, when the AI will be part of our new treatments or devices, it would also be part of that validation process. So, of course, we would need um, the legislative means for that, while guidelines would be probably more specific and more flexible as well, so we can change them. So, that's my understanding on how to answer this question. Yeah, many thanks, Elena. Any of the other panelists want to have a crack at that one? Um, well, Danny here, if I, if I may, um, maybe just to, to extend this a little as well, when we talk about framework and, and guidelines, 
I think one point which hasn't been really touched upon, but w which is also quite essential, certainly if we look from a medtech perspective, is the work on standardization, um, where we, we see a lot of developments at the European level, but also at international level, and where, of course, uh, a AI standards are, are being developed around many different aspects when it comes to safety or trustworthiness or ethical aspects. Some of those are, are basically, let's say, cross-sector, others are more healthcare-specific. Um, so there is certainly important work to do there. At the same time, it's, it's very, very difficult and, and very uh, resource-intensive uh, for industry to stay on top of all these different initiatives as, as well. Um, but hopefully we will see a more convergent approach on standardization as well. Uh, so that it's more clear, not only for industry, but also for other stakeholders, what is the sort of basis on, on which these concepts of um, safety, uh, reliability, um, bias, non-discrimination, which is the basis on which this is being built, uh, what, what is being used for uh, demonstration or, or conformity assessment, even though standards are in itself uh, voluntary, they, they do give some direction and, and, and steering towards uh, different stakeholders as to what is considered a best practice, state of the art or, or minimum level uh, that provides some kind of um, safeguard and, and, and insurance as well to, to the users of these uh, applications. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Danny. Uh, any of the other panel members want to join in, I thought? Well, well, maybe uh, maybe with, in respect to the last point of the question, whether it should be on European level or member state le level, I think this, sh this should clearly be on European level. We should have, of course, one uh, guideline, uh, but we should leverage data on a European level to assess our AI algorithms in a standardized way. Um, so I, I would definitely go for a European level uh, development of both of these com the concepts in this question. Okay, no, no, thanks for that, Peter. You, you won't be surprised. I'm very happy to hear that, of course. Um, okay, any more from the panel on this one before I move on? Um, T Tony, I, I might come in here uh, just yeah. briefly. I mean, I mentioned, I think, in my contribution that a number of the recommendations are interlinked, and I think this is an example. Yeah. Um, we're expecting to get the, the horizontal regulatory proposal from the Commission tomorrow, and clearly that reflects the, the fact that AI cuts across a number of different uh, regulatory frameworks as currently established. But I also think, particularly in the healthcare setting, we have to be very mindful of the fact that AI can be used in a way which, I suppose, involves the, the clinical use across different regulatory frameworks. So, you know, software incorporating AI that may itself be regulated as a medical device, but may be influencing the use of medicines in clinical practice. And we do, I think, need to look at the frameworks around that and then develop guidance based on those frameworks that fit within those frameworks. So the two, to my mind, are very interlinked. And I, I would agree it needs to be done at a European level as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. What Lauren says is absolutely, uh, in my sort of intervention as well, we group those two um, uh, recommendations together for exactly that reason. So would very much agree and again, agree European level is the way to do it. And maybe no, no, also just to, to add that, I mean, it, it's not, this is not a thing that regulators sit down and do and agree upon. Uh, uh, so, so this is really interlinked also with going out and, and talking to experts and uh, talking to patient groups and healthcare professionals uh, about uh, and, and end users eventually. Um, and that's also what we realized when we did the AI workshop together with the FDA and, and, and industry representatives. So data managers uh, had a lot of uh, think, good things to say here and were in, involved and had a hands-on experience. Um, and the eClinical Forum we also engaged with is also a, a group that is uh, across different organizations and um, I think it's hugely important to 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 start talking to each other because when when we go out as regulators and give recommendations what we don't really want is that that can be constantly challenged and we didn't really have hands on because we weren't experienced enough at the time when we had to start giving regulations uh, so so um, that it's it's an it's interlinked with those criteria as well. No, 
many thanks for that, Elizabeth and colleagues. It, if we move on, now, there's another question now, and it was sort of touched on by one of the panelists. Indeed, was uh, uh, I think it was a wildcard uh, uh, concern or recommendation about the liability. So, question is, would the liability for AI systems be different from the liability in other medical expert system uses? And there's a, a well, I mean, there's a reference to a, a, a quite, quite an established reference. I won't give the date, but basically, so it's essentially in what sense is is it any different from other medical expert system uses? I suppose that's sort of expert uh, clinical decision making tools that may already be in 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 use in in various areas of practice. So, quite a broad topic. Any any of the panelists have the courage to engage with this one as a kickoff? He said, hopefully. I can make, um, it was my wild card, so <laughs> I okay. can make a short comment. So I, I, I'm not a, a legal expert knowing every single detail about liability. Uh, my understanding is uh, from the EU product liability, for example, regulation that exists is quite old that it would need to be brought into the digital age. Uh, possibly liability on medical devices that is being uh, that are entering into the market. This is addressed in the medical devices regulation. But in the future, uh, we hear from patients, from discussions we've heard with patients as as part of uh, uh, the big data at heart Hub project and, and other uh, activities. We often hear, um, you know. From people who like how why I mean as part of the trust about co-deciding on what's the treatment pathway, um, people are quite concerned about you know in case of mistakes you usually tend as as an individual you tend to put the blame to your doctor like you you rely on your doctor to make a wise decision and help you. Uh, and guide you into taking in, in the decision of and giving your approval for an intervention to be made. And what if uh, now with artificial intelligence being mainstream in healthcare, when then people are concerned, then should should the blame be, should I blame my doctor if I go through an invasive procedure that in the end does not improve my quality of life or does not uh, improve my health outcomes? So that's an issue that um, I think it will need to be clarified. So uh, I don't know if the regulations at the moment are sufficient, but they seem to be, they would need to be brought into, to be modernized and be, be brought into the digital era. Thanks, Marilena. Any, any other panelists want to have a go, Mark? Um, difficult one, but I, I'll give it a go. Um, I mean, I, I think there are different considerations that we need to think about that are, are maybe not the same in clinical decision making um, systems. Um, I, I think critical, and you know, going back to the point I made, you know, we do need you know sort of patient panels, citizen involvement in terms of l looking at teasing out some of these challenging areas that we may not have quite thought through completely. And um, so I, I think there, it, it's sort of probably one that's still open. There's not an open you know, shut sort of case in relation to it, but it is something that we probably need to think about a little bit more. And I'm glad that the um, panelists, I think it's Torsten brought it up because uh, it is probably something we need to think about a little bit more. Um, and maybe maybe to add, I think it's also very important that we have we should have a discussion at some point on terminology. So what's really the difference between an AI system and a, and a, a, a medical support system? I mean, those things are I think, yeah. both having the same goal, right? So we should have a very clear terminology or, or some guidelines on this because I think there's not much difference between those actually. And AI is a often used term, but it's not my favorite term for these type of uh, systems. Yeah. Yeah, um, if, and then here, if I may, uh, from from our side, from from medtech industry, what we have done, for instance, is we we have been publishing a number of AI use cases from our members, which are actually being used in practice, um, and and that sort of indicates that what we see currently on the market, most of the AI based applications are decision support systems. They're they're not autonomous uh, decision making uh, systems. Um, we see that also in, in the legal framework for the for the MDR in, in terms of the classification. It has a risk-based approach for, for medical software or software as a medical device. Uh, where it's sort of um, the risk classification is based on the fact to what extent it informs or it drives um, 
the the decision of, of the clinician or, or to what extent it would actually treat or, or diagnose a patient. Um, so we, we do have a risk-based approach. Uh, the liability framework is still um, on the agenda for discussion at the political level. Um, the current landscape when it comes to liability is it, it's, it's very complex, it's very fragmented across member states. Uh, a number of studies have been done. You have the product liability directive. There are some other uh, liability frameworks as well that, that come into play. Um, the, I believe the conclusion from the studies that have been done is that, that there are some some risks with, with AI due to its characteristics that is uh, more opaque than, than other systems. Um, at the same time, the um, sort of preliminary conclusions were uh, as well that, that um, the more the decision would be driven uh, by the AI, of course, the more the liability would shift probably towards the developer or the manufacturer. Uh, but in, in, in many, Cases today, we still see that the the final judgment, or, or just the the judgment, is being done by the clinician and just being informed by the uh, by the system. So I, I think it's an ongoing discussion. It's certainly also a part of of the uh, issues around uh, trust, so that people know that AI based applications are uh, are rightly used and and uh, qualified to be used by by professionals. Many thanks for that, Danny. There's a couple now that have come in, so if, if I just move it on a bit, because um, uh, one is, could you please share your thoughts on prioritizing AI types? So I suppose uh, NLP pattern recognition, tracking, um, upskilling, setting guidelines based on that prioritization. So so any, any sort of uh, sequencing with regards to AI types or subtypes, uh, yeah, language processing, pattern recognition, or tracking systems? Anyone have any views on that? Um, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Doug Gregory from uh, Digital Europe here. I, I think uh, I'm starting to see us reach for the stars, but I'm a little bit worried about whether or not we're going to trip over our shoelaces a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I'm seeing that because when I look across the uh, presentations that we had in the session just before this, we, we when we look across the, at the capabilities that we have within the network right now, they're actually quite modest across every part of digitalization and artificial intelligence that we've been talking around. And and so I'll go back to my two points I raised in, in, in my intervention. One is, are we sure we have the right level of resource and capabilities at national level? We talk about a European level, but one could define the European level as being the commission and and the EMA. And, and I think that's important to have that strength there. But I think if our national competent authorities are not able to keep pace with the advancements, uh, then the network doesn't move forward. Even if the EMA could move forward, the network will hold the EMA back, right? So that's, I think, one point. Secondly, when it comes to which area uh, uh, for prioritization, I think particularly when we're looking at the adoption of new technologies into a network as opposed to a unitary entity, it's going to be really important for the network to figure out what delivers the most value earliest. And, and that's where I would say it's the responsibility of the HMA and the network to really go through and find out which areas can they deliver uh, advantages, whether those are efficiency advantages or advantages in 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 looking at pharmacovigilance or or some other area, but you shouldn't be listening to industry about what your priorities are. You should be figuring out what your priorities are yourself as a network. Thanks. Hey, thanks very much for that. Uh, I mean, I suppose the whole genesis of this coming out of the the big data and the strategy investment and the fact that it's. Uh, a HMA EMA sort of jointly sponsored workshop to try to get our heads around uh, strategic direction and recommendations to take forward over the next five years is that we do have the ambition to sort of travel on this journey or address this challenge together. So it's um, uh, nobody says Europe is 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 is, a, is easy, but uh, certainly it is what it is today and and where we want to try to take it tomorrow. So. Um, but the idea that we have some, somehow a, a sort of different speed at the center and a different speed at the network, 
that that I, th I find difficult, I must admit, as, as, as a concept. But any, any more comments on the panel with regards to um, the specificities with regards to any sort of staging or, 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 or on the actual subtypes of, of AI itself? Um, if not, then there's another question coming in about uh, what should somebody do developing something that I wouldn't mind throwing at you. But but back to the, uh, does anyone have any views on prioritizing AI types uh, at this stage with regards to guidelines? Well, so I think that uh, unlocking data in text, unstructured data is, should be a very high priority for us. I think there's still a lot of information that's not structured in the medical records. Uh, yeah. in, in multiple languages as well. So there's quite a challenge to do multilingual type of NLP. Uh, and I think if we want to find the right patients for our questions, we need to unlock the unstructured data still, uh, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I, I would agree. Uh, I think it should be a, a high priority as well. It's the big challenge that we face. Okay. No. Thank you very much for that, guys. And, and, and if we move it on then, because uh, we are starting to... Um, now, a very interesting question coming in from industry um, is what would be the strategy recommended by the panelists for current software as medical device that are about to start their submission, okay? And, and it's to wait for the regulation or to submit a risk-based documentation with all the, the challenges that follow a de novo submission. So I suppose that's a, that's a real real politic type question guys you know you go ahead now and, and hit the system as it is in its stage of maturity or to is it better you know wiser to delay and wait for the regulatory environment to mature so anyone uh, take a starter on that one yeah uh, tony maybe i can start so i i think i'm not a medical device specialist at all so i'm, I'm in 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 gcp but and it could also be DCP, but I'm thinking that in any such cases, what I would go for would be to seek scientific advice at uh, at the medicines agencies and the medical device agencies if, if those are separate, because I, I wouldn't, you know, just throw all my money in and go for something and then uh, risk a, a rejection based on, on, on some criteria that are suddenly turned out to be important. But on the other hand, uh, we were talking about that making guidelines also takes a considerable amount of time and the more people we need to to agree with, the longer it takes. So so I, I would go for neither of those, but go in between and say what kind of scientific advice can we can we get at the moment? Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Elizabeth. I don't know, Larry, do you want to complement with that from the EOIM perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Elizabeth, you know, to, to seek scientific advice um, would, would be a good strategy. I think also to, to look for, you know, currently available guidance from regulatory authorities. Uh, there, then there is guidance available uh, and they highlight the main considerations at the very least that regulatory authorities will have when reviewing submissions. And I suppose the other point would be given the imminent proposal from the Commission to keep an eye out for that because that's going to have some important concepts, I'm sure, within it that are going to be considered by medicines regulators and medical devices regulators as well. So I think I'd be carefully studying that document when it comes out in the next few days. Yeah. yeah. And, and and just on that point, guys, because the phrase, the, the question is interestingly phrased, is to wait for the regulation. I mean, is there a single regulation that we're all waiting for that's going to sort of unlock the system in Europe? You know, you, you mentioned, Larry, the transversal one indeed, but to my mind, there isn't a single, you know, there's never going to be a nirvana moment where it's it's risky to go because of the uncertainties and then all of a sudden it's not going to be risky because it's going to be, you know, complete clarity in this area. I really do think it's it's a learning by doing type of system. There's a lot of goodwill. There's an awareness, I think, amongst the regulators, um, certainly right across all of the strategy documents that, you know, uh, the, the convergence of these technologies is something that's got to be facilitated. And the reason for that is that these really make differences you know to patients uh, lives in terms of their medical treatment and and that it's an absolute obligation on us all as a collective to enable that to happen and and you know the, the idea of waiting for the perfect regulatory framework frankly speaking like in many other areas of the system it's just to my mind it's just not going to happen so we we've got to get on and do and, and try to evolve the framework as best we can going forward but uh, if anybody wants to differ and sort of say there is the regulation that we should be hanging out for, 
I would love to hear the the argument presented. No. I think yeah, I, I think the medical device regulation. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, that's effective. Uh, I mean, here we are, twentieth of April. So to my mind, it's it's May. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. It's also it covers only certain um, software, not all, because for self-learning algorithms, there is nothing for the moment. So maybe there will be in the future. Maybe they won't. Um, so yeah, we will see how it goes. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> I hadn't thought about the, the regulation in terms of the devices. It is upon us, you know, after a one year delay, guys. Yeah. Um, there was another question because we're coming towards, um, hang on now, just uh, uh, there, there was a, um, so we've done that one. Tony, shall, yeah. shall we move to this? Do, 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 we have five minutes. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, no, no, thank you. So th that's Luis, actually. Yeah, I, I just wanted. There was another question on the um, open regulatory data, and it was put in from one of the industry uh, colleagues. And what they essentially said is there a difference perspective with regards to the brand perspective on open regulatory data vis-a-vis -vis the generic industry. So I suppose, you know, that 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 is an extension then of of the rather classical, you know, with the non-clinical clinical data set generated by the brand, and and then essentially after a period of exclusivity then you know fair competition from the generic industry with regards to uh you know second third entry products uh with regards to to generics or biosimilars i suppose in these days so it, i think it's another element on on that open regulatory data discussion that would be very useful to dive into with with regards to that perspective but Lewis is is very correct in reminding me we we are the sands of time are running through this session and i think um uh, if, if we then can can start to draw to a close, and Lewis, I hand over to you for essentially to do a Slido consultation on the audience online uh, to try to see where, where where do they where do they assess the state of play. But please take it from here. Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, yes, I think that it would be a good opportunity uh, for the audience to provide their votes um, after this roundtable, and particularly those that are following via the broadcast who have not been uh, able to be as interactive as those in the in the webex and there's a little uh, slider i'm going to i'm going to open and uh, fundamentally you just need to select um the three um priorities uh, that you see more important let me see if i can get this right um share application and Okay, so you see the Slido in your screen. You can join by going to slido.com and putting in the hashtag there. Uh, or if you want to um, pull out your mobile phones and use the QR code, that would be great. And I'll give everybody a minute to um, log in and um, jot out the questions. So Tony, this is quite an interesting result. It it matches uh, pretty much with with the um, with the survey results, the, the pre workshop survey result, and and we're still um, those that are voting still consider as the highest priority uh, to develop a framework to assess and validate AI and to build a framework that supports the development of guidelines and and also to upskill EMA and regulatory network. So I'll let people still vote, but um, um, I'm mindful of time. Maybe you want to do some closing notes, um, Tony. Thanks. 
Yeah, no, no. Uh, thanks very much for that, Luis. And, and uh, yeah, it's always very interesting to do these uh, live polling events. You know, it's 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 a novelty that we've had in the last couple of years, without a doubt. Even accelerated by the the pandemic virtual experience. So um, I think we're all learning to get our heads around that. You know, sort of uh, decision making, live decision making in action. Um, I, I mean, just by way of, of summary of this session, there's no way in hell that I can that I can do it justice in terms of we had a very broad scope with regards to taking all of these uh, recommendations that were already there identified from multiple strategies and multiple sort of sessions, scratching our heads about what to do and how to address and how to break down this challenge. I'm very grateful to to all of my panelists um, that have been assembled here today that, that Peter and Luis put together and 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 you know doing their best then to not just actually give their top two to three recommendations in 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 a, like a super brief period which in itself you know to do that in two to three minutes is 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 really a great achievement in itself and it was quite striking the sort of you know the, the spectrum and the diversity of that opinion uh, particularly representing the different sort of perceptions and sensitivities of of the groupings that they represent and and i i think some of the questions it was good to see from the audience with regards to the engagement not just with the the sequence of recommendations uh that have been identified and, and their potential prioritization, but also the sort of interconnections between them and also the complexity of some of the concerns that we're going to have to unpick collectively together over the years to come. But, uh, but I do think we can give a commitment that uh, this whole process uh, has been very useful to us, at least to, to guide our next steps uh, as we go uh, to try to implement various aspects of, of, of this ambition to engage with the AI challenge uh, in, in, the, in the years to come, certainly with regards to the European uh, situation, but also very mindful international collaborations just making an appearance there as joint sixth uh, as, as I close out this remark. And I know that um, Peter and the colleagues and, and working together with the HMA colleagues with, with Nikolai, who I'll now be handing over to close out the, um, uh, to close out the workshop, uh, we'll, we'll be taking that on board and hopefully then breaking it down into a plan of actions that can start to deliver the change. Um, and, and, and we genuinely will look forward to having the dialogue with those brave developers to take the first steps and actually trying to apply these in the development uh, of of medicines and and also uh, you know well healthcare delivery more generally um, and it's it's a great challenge to have and let's hope that we're able to rise to it in the years to come guided by the reflections that we've had together today not just in this session but for the last two afternoons and and with that then guys again if i can thank my panelists uh, we can't do the usual uh, indication of 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 applause which is so it's virtual applause on your behalf i can only extend to them and i can then link maybe and pass on to uh, uh, nikolai brun who i think will be closing this workshop so hopefully nikolai you're online and this is not a surprise to you over it shouldn't be i hope you can hear me now <laughs> Um, but uh, I also want to echo Tony and uh, Luis. I want to say thank you to everyone who has participated uh, in, during these two days. Um, I think we've had a broad scope of presentations. We have been dealing with a variety of aspects of the use of AI in the regulatory context. Um, and we've heard from a variety of speakers from both sides of the Atlantic, uh, very inspirational um, uh, with also glimpses into the future. Um, and certainly, we have our hands full. We have lots to um, deal with. Um, the definition of AI is still a little bit up in the air, uh, all the way from basic robotics, natural language processing, uh, machine learning, uh, imaging interpretation and analysis, uh, and uh, all the way to deep learning algorithms. Um, and certainly, the more advanced it gets, uh, the greater the regulatory issues in uh, regulating this, this area. Uh, we started yesterday with a great example of how we can improve outcomes in cancer patients using AI. Um, and then we use, it went on to discuss predictive modeling and the need for common data models in interpreting it, uh, making the best use of the AI algorithms, uh, certainly a structured data set 
makes it much easier both to train and to validate the algorithms used. We proceeded to learn about digital twins and personalized medicine, and we heard from across the Atlantic about data as the new soil to be utilized by all, not a single currency uh, that can only be owned by one party, but something that can be shared and used by many people simultaneously in good spirit of ethical and uh, secure use. We also learned about the deep learning healthcare system uh, moving forward, and indeed something as complex as digital therapeutics. Um, and we le learned that algorithms need oversight and perhaps something as uh, elegant as stewardship going forward so that we can make sure that they're deployed in a secure and predictive way uh, with benefit for everyone. Uh, we then heard about AI for use uh, within pharmacovigilance surveillance and also in devices. We learned about AI in development from a, the FDA colleagues, and also a company uh, presented their use of AI in drug development. Today, we have seen how AI fits in with the European regulatory strategy um, and how AI has a very fundamental and central place in it. Uh, we have discussed the Big Data Task Force recommendation that are now being implemented by the Big Data Steering Group, and we heard that transparency and auditability are fundamentals of this. Indeed, black boxes that are not being open to interrogation is something that should be avoided. We should open, use open source software uh, wherever it is possible so that we don't have black boxes that uh, don't generate trust by the public. We also heard about the collaboration across the globe in the ICMRA collaboration with stress tests of AI use uh, for regulators. And uh, I agree with Tony that in today's roundtable, it's very difficult to sum up in just a few words. There were so many uh, important perspectives that were captured by the panelists uh, in the, the various presentations um, and in the discussions, and also with a very good uh, participation from uh, the, uh, panel, uh, the panelists and the participants from around Europe and the world. We learned towards the end that there's a consensus uh, developing towards the top priority being that we develop a framework to assess and validate AI, and that a framework for supporting the development of guidelines is equally desirable. Um, and certainly, I think, in my view, um, we also need to find out what is done by the regulators and what is done by the companies. We have, for many years, put the burden of safety and efficacy demonstration on the innovators and the companies, and then we, as the regulators, make sure that this is also the way it should be before a drug is approved. Similarly, uh, you could say that an AI algorithm that is being deployed by a company as part of a regular, so, regulatory submission must be the responsibility of the applicant, and then we, as regulators, have the oversight and make, must make sure that this has been deployed correctly when we assess the application. It very quickly ends up with a need for resources and upskilling of the network, as we have heard. And when we had one company present to us yesterday that they intend to use AI to increase their regulatory submissions from about 1,000 per year to more than 35,000 per year, there is no doubt that we are in front of a tsunami of new submissions that will come to us as part of the increased deployment of AI. So that certainly puts the need for upskilling and resourcing into perspective. I think we have had fantastic dialogue today. I thank everyone. I know that uh, Luis and his good colleagues will gather all the input it will be published on the website together with the presentations that were made so we can, in a transparent and uh, uh, very direct way, make sure that nothing is lost from these two valuable days. This has been part of uh, one of the recommendations from the Big Data Steering Group. It's been part of the work plan that we hosted this uh, workshop today with the participation of not just academia, 
regulators, industry, but also very importantly, healthcare providers and patients. Uh, because in the end, that's who we're really here for. This is for the benefit of the patients. And this is what we really hope that we can improve the lives of the patients by deploying new technologies and rational use of data. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much for a very exciting couple of days um, and wish you all the best going forward. Um, and uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much.